Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Aspiring Women. The topic is healing groovy. We're talking about wound healing. And as always, the re refreshments reflect the topic. Nutrition is really important for wound healing and for good skin integrity. A good balanced diet with foods from all the different food groups is important especially having adequate carbohydrate so that the protein you eat actually is used for healing versus energy needs. There are also several nutrients when you're looking at healing wounds that are important, including vitamin C, vitamin A, and zinc. The refreshments today have good doses of all those vitamins. The first item that we're serving is our appetizer, which is snow pea, orange, and jicama salad. This is a good source of vitamin C as well as vitamin A. It is a, has a little bit of carbohydrate in it, it's a colorful salad, it has crunch, and it's super easy to make. The most important nutrient for wound healing is protein. And the Mediterranean wraps that are being offered today have 34 grams of protein per wrap. That is a, probably a good third to a half of, a pro, of the protein an individual needs for wound healing on a daily basis. It also provides the needed carbohydrate for energy. And because it has such good ingredients as um, tomatoes and chopped cucumber, it is a source of vitamin A and vitamin C. And who says you can't have cookies for breakfast? Today we are offering the carrot cake breakfast cookies. They contain fresh ingredients like sh shredded carrots, which we all know carrots are a good source of vitamin A. There's also things like flaxseed and seasonings like cinnamon and nutmeg and applesauce instead of the fat. Five grams of protein per cookie makes it a good rounded start to your day. A good basic diet is really what is needed. So eating a good variety of foods is important to get the nutrients that you need. Eat foods from all the food groups, try to get them in every day, and if you fall short, a multivitamin may help. Enjoy. Welcome everyone. Hello. Are you all aspiring women tonight? This is our inaugural event as aspiring women. Pretty exciting. So we're gonna start off with a little flower power. We're gonna show you the website. If you just, so we'd like to, this is the Aspirus website. It's aspirus.org. And what we want you to see is that when you go down to the bottom of that page, see that daisy that looks just like this daisy? Our little flower power. If you click on that daisy, we're gonna show you our Aspiring Women page. Now on this page, there's a lot of things. There is a lot of health information, there are recipes, there are uh, panel cards or information about things that you should be uh, informed about at a certain age, so there decade, there's decade information. There's also the ability to sign up for our events. And what's really exciting is that these events are going to be in every Aspirus hospital. So if you find that you're up in the Upper Peninsula, you know, maybe camping or something, you could maybe check out Aunt Noggins or Iron Rivers. So it's just a fun page and I wanted you to see that that is available to you now. I hope you're enjoying your new venue. We have moved to Hotel Mead so we can accommodate all of you and that you have better viewing. In fact, this is probably in some lady's ways. So I'll have to move this. There we go. And I wanted to introduce you to our agenda for this evening. So we have some very special entertainment that I will soon tell you about. You've seen the Aspiring Women webpage. I'll introduce our speakers, or at least one speaker. Our other speaker is going to be a little late tonight, but our speaker on Healing Groovy. We will have our usual question and answer period. And then, of course, the door prizes, an announcement of the next event, and then you'll get your Aspirus gift, as always. 
So first, let me talk about a very special group who is here to entertain you this evening. This is their first public showing. They are the aspiring a cappella group, and they all work at Aspirus Riverview. Ladies, will you please come forward? First up in the red scarf is Peggy King. Peggy is an administrative assistant for our CEO, Todd Birch. Next to her is Kathleen Orminski. Kathleen is the director of the emergency department. And next to Kathleen, wave Cindy, is Cindy Orzel, who is our HR business partner. Oh, a few people in the audience know her. <laughs> you have a fan club, and we will take autographs afterwards. And then at the end in the lovely purple scarf is Rhonda Alf, who is an administrative assistant to our VP of quality. Now these ladies, three of them discovered each other when they planned to sing for a birthday party. It's right here in the front row. Right here in the front row. And while they were singing at this birthday party, a fourth one appeared and happened to be able to sing a part that they didn't have covered. So it was, it was quite incredible. And I also want you to know that in the back of the room, they do have a manager. <laughs> manager Mary Dorsky. You cannot book these ladies if you don't go through Mary. <laughs> and remember that aspiring women are first priority. So our events first, anything outside comes second. All right, ladies, without further ado, them now <laughs> and I don't blame you I have them lined up for a few dates already so you know get behind me thank you very much Peggy Rhonda Cindy and Kathleen and now I will introduce Amanda Austin who is the director of the Aspirus Riverview Wound Healing and Hyperbaric Center Amanda, you may recognize her, some of you. She is a native of Wisconsin Rapids, graduated from Lincoln High School. She received her bachelor's in both business administration and marketing from Lakeland College. And guess what? Despite her full plate, Amanda has decided to get married in about five weeks. She's marrying a man who dated her for nine years. Wasn't it nine? Eleven. 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 <laughs> and she has patiently waited for that engagement ring, and it's happened. Together, she and her fiance have two dogs, Maggie, who is a new puppy, and I hear kind of a terror, and Goofy. They, she, Amanda recently accepted a new position with Aspirus as the system manager of patient scheduling. So she'll be leaving the Wound Healing Center, but she has done a great job there. And I say that because I was the director before her and she came in and just took it to a new level. 
Following Amanda will be Dr. Marjorie Miller, who is a little late because Dr. Marjorie had a prior commitment, but she's going to hear, be here by 6. I have had the pleasure of working with Dr. Miller when I was director of the Wound Center, and I consider her one of the best of the best. She has a bachelor's from New York University, where she met her husband, Dieter. She received her medical degree from Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and she did her residency in general surgery at the State University of New York in Buffalo. She is board certified in general surgery, excuse me, and is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. She has also received special certification in wound care and hyperbaric oxygen therapy from Ohio State University. More importantly, Dr. Miller has three lovely children. Salem, who attends UW-Stevens Point, a son Ian in high school, and a daughter Mirabelle in elementary school. The reason Dr. Miller is not here with us right now is because she is a STEM scout leader, which means that she teaches science, technology, engineering, and math to a bunch of elementary girls. That's, that's a great thing, a busy lady. So taking us off will be Amanda, and I'm going to turn the mic over to her. Let me bring up your program. Good evening, aspiring women. How's everyone doing tonight? You guys have a very good meal? It looked like it was very awesome. Some really good looking recipes. Well, I'm here tonight to talk about wound healing. That's why we're calling it Healing Groovy. I've been at the Wound Healing Center for just over three years, and I work with a wonderful staff. I've got a few of them with me today, just in case you guys have some excellent questions that I can't answer. Um, so we've got some of our HBO tech, as well as one of our nurses and our reception staff here today, just in case you stump me on a question. So just to get started, um, we will have a question and answer at the end. So please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Dr. Miller will be here as well, and we can answer any questions you guys may have. So what is a chronic wound? That's really what we do at the Wound Center, is chronic wounds. A chronic wound is a wound that you've had for at least three weeks. Many of the patients that we see have had wounds anywhere from three to four weeks to many, many years. We've had patients come to us that have had wounds for 15, 20 years, just thought that they had to live with that wound. They thought that that's something that was just something they would have to live with the rest of their life that they couldn't go swimming, they would have to manage dressings, and that was just part of their daily life. Then they heard about us through a friend or through some of our marketing or some of our different events, and we were able to get them healed. So they could go back to living a full life, to doing what they want, and not have to work around a wound. You don't have to live with a wound. That's something we can help you with. We have an excellent team of doctors and an excellent clinic staff that can help manage that for you. And really, in the United States, there are 6.7 million people every year that suffer with a chronic wound. That's a huge, huge amount of people. And a lot of people suffer in silence. They don't realize that they're very ashamed of having a wound. It's usually in a place that other people can't see on their feet or their legs, and they hide that. They all wear long pants or shoes that cover up their feet. Again, those are things that our staff are accustomed to working with every single day and really want to help you with. So why would you seek advanced care? So when a wound is not healing, whether it may be a wound on your foot, a wound on your leg, maybe it's a pressure ulcer on your, on your backside, those are an indication that there's something else going on. You get a wound for another reason. That's really why we're here. We're, what we do is we look at the patient as a whole. We work with the primary care, we look at your full history and find out what could be possibly causing that wound. Is it possible that you have diabetes or maybe undiagnosed diabetes? Is there something else going on, an infection or other reasons that may be causing you not to heal? Those are the kinds of things that we look at at the wound center. And really, by not healing a wound, by letting that go, you put yourself at a very significant risk for infection and other serious complications, including death due to the infection typically. One of the things to know about the Aspirus Riverview Wound Healing Center is we're actually one of the top wound centers in the nation. 
We work with another group called Heologics that works with us to educate our physicians and give us some additional information about wound care. And they manage over 800 centers nationwide. In that group, they look at and rank all of their centers based on quality statistics and how their patients rank them. So look directly at how patients and what they say, the patient satisfaction. Here at the Wound Center, we've actually been rated as top in the country, one of the top in the country, top 10%, two years in a row. And actually, this is our third award in the five years we've been open. So when you come to Aspires Riverview Hospital for wound care, you know that you're going to get the best care possible. We have all of the resources and treatments that you can get anywhere else in the state. We have hyperbaric medicine, which I'll get to a little bit more later, right here. So you don't have to travel to Wausau or Marshfield or further away to get care. You can come right down the street to Riverview and get that care that you need. In fact, all of our patients, 93% of our patients, leave with a healed wound. Nationwide, the average is about 90%. So we're above average there as well as at what we call our median days to heal. Typically, it takes most patients about 32 to 33 days to heal. We do it in about 28 for most patients. And our patient satisfaction rate is exceeding 94%. I think at the time we did this presentation, it was 94. The last time I looked, it was 96%, which is excellent. If you talk to any of the other people who work at Riverview here, that's a really hard thing to hit. That really says that our patients really feel cared for when they come to our center, when they get that care. And that's the feedback we get from all of our patients is that they feel like we're a second family. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize about chronic wounds is that it's a very serious problem in our country. With the rate of diabetes and obesity rising in our country, as well as population who isn't getting any younger, um, we are actually, wound care and the wound care associated reasons for the wounds actually have a higher mortality rate than many cancers. Looking at this chart, things like PAD, which is peripheral arterial disease or arterial disease, if you've heard of that, usually your heart and your arteries. And that's the same as ischemic ulcer, very similar. And neuropathic, meaning diabetic ulcer. Those mortality rates are actually higher than 50% at five years. That's higher than colon cancer, Hodgkin's disease, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. So it's, an, it's a thing that we don't talk about a lot in our society, but it is a very serious problem that a lot of people don't like to talk about. But that's why we're here today, to make sure all of you know that if you or someone you know is experiencing a wound, that it's not something to hide, it's something we can help you with and make sure that you don't become one of these statistics, that we can care for you and make sure that you live a long, happy life without wounds. One of the other things as well is 30% of patients with a wound will end up with an amputation within five years. And that's one of the things that one of our primary goals at the Wound Care Center is to prevent patients from having an amputation. For our patients, when they first come to our center, we evaluate, like we were talking about before, the whole patient, their full history, back to if they've had cancer when they were younger. Many of our patients are in their 60s or older, the very majority of our patients, and we will go back as far as in their early 20s. We've had a patient who um, had some history like that that we found out that their wound was healing because of something that happened to them when they were 18 years old that affected them later in life. So that's why we look at that whole story, your whole story, from the beginning to the end to find out what's causing that wound. <coughs> Most of our patients, a very wide majority of them, come every single week to see us. Their appointments take about an hour for most patients, depending on the wound, but we see them every single week. They become our family. And like I said, most of our patients heal in about four to six weeks, some even sooner, but we'll see them on a weekly basis. Some of the things that we check for when you come to the wound center are if you have proper, proper blood flow. So do you have enough blood getting to your wound? Most of the wounds are typically on their legs. We check nutritional status. Are you eating well? Are you getting enough nutrition to be able to heal the wound on your, on your own? Is there infection in that wound? Making sure that the wound is clean and free of any dead tissue. One of the things that our physicians do is they do what we call debridements, which cleans the wound of any dead tissue to make sure that the wound is actively healing. 
And Dr. Miller actually is joining us right now. Dr. Um, Nan introduced her earlier, and she's actually joining us at the moment, so she can explain a little bit more about some of the things we do on a first patient's visit as well. Thanks. Hi, I'm Dr. Miller. Sorry I'm late. I just had an activity with uh, third and fifth graders doing science, technology, engineering, mathematics, trying to get them motivated and enter the uh, science field. So um, I don't know where we are, we're just but. talking about some of the things that we're checking for on their first visit and as we're looking for why a wound is not healing. Yeah, so I don't know how far uh, Amanda got into you know, the talk, but uh, chronic wounds for us are anything that's going to be more than three weeks that's not healing. We expect most wounds to heal, but if it's going on three weeks, patients will come to us typically about their fourth week, sometimes even later, and the first visit with them, we're going to try to evaluate what underlying problems that they may have that's causing this not to heal. Diabetes is number one almost. Then we have venous disease, we have arterial disease, it could be malignancy, and sometimes we're diagnosing cancers in their wounds. So there are many, many causes of why a wound may not heal. So we start off with the patient, we tell them they are going to get a pretty much a very thorough evaluation of why. And sometimes it's a little much for them, but we need to get to the root cause. Otherwise, you can heal the wound, they'll be back in a couple months, a year, unless we treat the underlying problems. So if we know that they're not healing, we'll first and foremost, when we do their exam, we get a history, find out if they're diabetic, how well controlled it is. So then we, we may start off with labs, see where their hemoglobin, is, A1C, is it well controlled? If it's not well controlled, we're already thinking about setting up appointments with their primary care to get it better controlled, sending them to dietary nutrition to get a thorough evaluation with them and dietary of how they can make their diabetes well controlled. So we'll get labs, a full set of labs, looking at their chemistries, their, their kidney function, to see if their kidneys are working properly. Um, then we also, you know, in part of their exam, we'll check for pulses. Sometimes we may not feel a good pulse, and they may not know it. Or they'll say, well, my legs, you know, it's numb. I can't walk several blocks. That could be an indication of arterial disease. So we'll get Dopplers as a screening in the office then we can send them down to the vascular lab in radiology to get a, you know, an arterial brachial index, which is a measurement of their blood pressure, their ex lower extremity pressure compared to their upper extremity. It should be a ratio of one. So one to one, if your blood pressure is 140 in the arm, should be about 140 around the calves. If it's anything less than that, anything like 0.8, 80% less than what, I mean, of what it should be, that could be a sign that it may not heal. Then we'll study them with ultrasound, you know, and get them, you know, in this, their first visit, we're trying to get as much information as possible. So we'll get, uh, get them scheduled for, to have an ultrasound to see if they have adequate blood pressure or adequate blood flow. Is there a blockage there that we can open up? Blood flow is okay, then we'll, may proceed to their veins. We get a history. Well, what did you do when you worked? Were you standing on your feet for a long time? In my field, I'm standing in the operating room, so I'm at risk of venous disease. So I wear my compression stockings. They're on. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been wearing them since um, residency, since medical school, actually. Um, so were they standing quite a bit on concrete teachers here, beautician, they're on their feet, or someone that's sitting, they're not getting adequate return. So find out what they did. Do they have swelling? Do their, you know, does their leg ache at the end of the day versus if they are lifting their leg up? That's gonna drive us to think, okay, is it arterial or is it venous? Then we'll get them again down for an ultrasound to look at their veins and their vein pressure because there are things we can do for that as well. There's uh, new techniques, not just stripping, but, you know, minor techniques that we can do now without having to take the patient to the operating room to deal with their veins. So th these are some other things that we may look at. 
if the wound is not healing, again, let's say they come to us with a wound that's been there for about four months, we may get a baseline x-ray, depending on where it is, to see if there's infection in the bone that's stopping this. And if there is any indication of infection in the bone, they may need to have a bone biopsy and also IV antibiotics, which could be for six weeks. So we have to treat all, all the time the underlying disease. Um, we also like to find out uh, what medications they're on because certain medications will impair wound healing. Prednisone, a lot of people have arthritis. They're being treated with steroids, rheumatoid arthritis, methotrexates. We have patients that are from the cancer center. They're on chemotherapy drugs. That may also interfere with wound healing. So then we'll work with their primary care physician to see what drugs we can change Sometimes we'll call oncology, Dr. Kirschley, and says there's something else that we can put them on that won't interfere with wound healing. We'll speak to their rheumatologist. Are there alternatives that we can try to put them on? So in that first meeting, you know, we're getting labs, we're getting x-ray, we're setting up dietary appointments for nutrition, and uh, what else are we doing with them? That's, that's pretty, that's pretty, pretty much, much it. Things. Those are the bigger <laughs> things. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> and. Um, you know, we try to get all that information within the first two weeks of their visit. And sometimes because of scheduling, we may not get that two weeks, but we really try to get that information. And it's a lot, sometimes patients do complain to us, well, I was just here, can we get that? Well, we need to get to the root cause, okay? If we don't, then again, just treating the wound without the underlying problem, they'll be back, okay? So we do offer many types of treatments depending on what kind of wound you have. And we'll go through some of the types of treatments and Dr. Miller can explain what they're used for when they're used. Yeah. So these are some of the treatments that we use. Compression therapy. Compression is for venous disease, people who have swelling in their legs. Um, if they have arterial disease, meaning that they're not getting blood flow to their tissues, we don't want to use compression. Uh, it has to be a certain level of blood flow before we can use compression because we could make their legs worse. So that's the importance of getting those arterial studies and the ultrasounds and their ABIs. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is something that we also use uh, when we've exhausted a lot of our conventional treatment or we can use it as an adjunct with our conventional treatment. So we opened up somebody's blockage in their leg um, after four weeks, if we notice that the wound has stalled, we can add hyperbaric oxygen. Um, we'll go through that more too. Yeah. Treatment of infection at the first appointment, chronically, sometimes we'll do a punch biopsy to see if there's any organisms. We'll treat that based on what's growing. We'll put them on antibiotics. Debridement, that's really a big component of what we do. Debridement is when we're using a instrument, a scalpel or curette, scissors, to get rid of dead tissue, because as long as there's dead tissue, the wound will not heal. Nutritional support, again, that's important. Um, whether it's diabetes or just somebody that's just not getting adequate nutrition, we'll supplement with uh, vitamins, zinc. We will get a baseline pre-albumin that lets us know what their protein levels are. And if it's low, less than 20, we will add, ask the patient to supplement with either Ensure, Boost. Uh, for diabetics, we use uh, Glucerna. So that'll give us nutritional support. And you'd be surprised that we've done everything and the nutrition is so low, nothing's going to heal. The minute we boost the nutrition, it starts to heal. And sometimes we've had to go as far as having to put a special IV to give additional nutritional support. Uh, treatment of blood flow issues. Again, that's with the uh, arteries or the veins. So referral for surgery to the vascular surgeon if they need to have their arteries open or if their veins uh, ablated. And specialized wound dressings, more so than what the primary care can provide in the office. We have a lot of advanced wound products, skin substitutes that we can use and offloading, which is very important with pressure ulcers, people who have pressure ulcers, as long if they do not take off that pressure that caused the wound, then they'll constantly 
be back. So we may order special mattresses for them, special cushions for the wheelchair if a person is in a wheelchair, shoes. special shoes if they're not wearing the proper <laughs> shoes if they're diabetic. So those are off, all offloading products we could use, whether it's their shoes, their bed, their wheelchair. So to go, we're going to go through a few more of the types of wounds a little more in depth, um, just to kind of give you some statistics on how common these are. Diabetic foot ulcer patients, over 2 million a year. So there's a lot of diabetics, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but 2 million plus a year will experience a diabetic foot ulcer. Over 800,000 venous ulcers a year, nearly 3 million pressure ulcers. Now patients who are really at risk for pressure ulcers, people who sit a lot, who are not very mobile, um, people who are in wheelchairs, bed bound, am I missing any other ones for pressure? Uh, no, and pressure can start as early as for trauma patients, just being on that board that the EMT or the paramedics bring them on. If they're on it for 20 minutes, that starts the pressure ulcer. So now with trauma patients, the minute they come to the trauma bay in the ER, we work as fast as possible to get them off that board because that will start pressure. Yep. And that's something we watch for very closely in the hospital as well. Patients who are in the hospital and are, are immobile, a lot of times you'll see they'll have things on their legs to help elevate them and keep them moving so they're not on pressure points. Um, surgical trauma patients, about over 500,000. Mm -hmm. And arterial patients is nearly 400,000 a year. And 30% of wounds that are untreated, left untreated people who leave that without going to their doctor and getting a referral or getting that wound healed, 30% of those will go to an amputation. And 50% of patients who have an amputation have more, well, at five years, it's a 50% mortality rate for those patients who have an amputation. So that's why it's so important to go to your doctor if you have a wound for whatever reason that's not healing. So diabetics. <coughs> 29 plus million people a year have diabetes. And that number is just rising as we go from year to year. That number we'll see all, every year. That's 1.4 million new diabetics every single year. 25% will develop a foot ulcer. So not all diabetics get a foot ulcer. It's usually those who are at risk or not managing their diabetes well that will get a foot ulcer. And again, we'll see one in four of them. And one of our primary goals, we talked about this earlier, is to prevent that amputation. We want to heal that wound soon enough so that patients don't get an infection like Dr. Miller was talking about in the bone that makes things worse and starts, starts right. that downward spiral. Right. And most of the amputations that we see are not because of trauma. Most of them are for the reasons of a non-healing wound. Well, right. And if we have to amputate you know, someone's uh, limb, then that really, that takes them out of the workforce. It's, it's just spiraling. So if we can prevent an amputation, we can keep that person productive. And a lot of times, if a patient loses a foot or a lower part of a lower extremity, that's even less mobile that they're going to be and more risk that they're putting themselves for pressure ulcers and other right. wounds. I'll let you talk about diabetes. Now. Yeah, so uh, diabetes, as you can see, uh, 28 million people, again, in, with diabetes and 1.4 new 1.4 million new diabetics a year so it's it's staggering uh, the complications from diabetes uh, slow wound healing the uh, environment of the high blood sugar impacts the immune system so therefore you will get you know the wounds won't heal the arteries also start to stiffen and also if the person smokes you, you can pretty much make that 100% fold worse, that their wounds will not heal. So they have lower immunity and neuropathy. So uncontrolled or uh, not well controlled diabetes will lead to neuropathy where they get numbness in their legs, numbness in their fingers and toes. And what can happen with that, somebody may step on a pin and not even know it. We've had people who, you know, I used to take care of patients who came in and they're like, oh yeah, I was sewing and I lost that pin and never found it and it was in their foot for about a week and that puts them at risk of losing that limb. So it's important we try to teach our diabetics when they're at home you must wear slippers. You can't go on the deck you know outside when it's 100 degrees because that deck's going to be a 
100 degrees and they will not feel the burn. And you know, we do get patients come in that way. So neuropathy is very significant. And again, poor nutrition. Even if they get a rock in their shoe, or most people will feel that rock. Right. They'll keep walking on that and continue until they get a wound and may not even realize they have that wound. Uh, treatment for diabetic foot ulcers, again, can include uh, support for their nutrition to manage their blood sugar. So we'll get them in with their di with their nutritionist or their internist or the primary care to help with that. Again, offloading. We have them um, get special shoes, uh, insurance pays. That is one of the, the you know, disease states that they will pay for special shoes. For arterial disease, they will not pay for shoes, but for diabetic, they will. Um, treatment for infection, you know, as long if infection in someone who does not have diabetes can put them in the hospital, could make them pretty septic. So we want to treat that. Uh, special dressings that we use, and again, debridement is key, getting rid of the dead tissue weekly. And again, if we have to, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy to help heal that wound. Uh, venous arterial disease is the second most common cause of ulcers for the lower extremity. So again, 600,000 people suffer from venous insufficiency and the cost is staggering. Not only the cost of the treatment, but the cost if they're not going to work as well. Um, chronic wounds affect approximately 6.7 million people in the United States and the cost exceeds 50 billion annually. And, and that cost is looking at everything from not just the cost of actually coming for care, it's actually more cost effective to get care for a wound right away than it is to wait. The longer you wait, the higher risk you are for having to stay in a nursing home for longer, the extra care that may be needed for nursing care, extra dressings, extra higher level of care, and that's what all goes into that $50 billion a year. And it's just, it's a staggering cost for patients to have to bear for communities for insurance, and that's why we want to manage it as soon as we can find it. Okay. Americans who have lower extremity arterial disease, um, they can develop ulcerations. One of the first signs they may have is that they, you know, they walk a block and they feel like their legs, they're just not having, uh, they're having too much pain walking. So they have to stop and rest feels good again, walk again. So that may be a first sign that you may have arterial disease, okay. Um, compression therapy, again, that we use for venous disease uh, as opposed to arterial disease. Uh, surgery that can involve minimally invasive where we bring them into the radiology suite or an, an outpatient suite where they just go into a, an artery with a little catheter and open up the vessel. Sometimes they may need a stent. Sometimes the minimally invasive may not work or the patient is just not amenable from the get-go and they may need an open surgery. Um, that one, they'll be hospitalized typically for about a week as opposed to the minimally invasive. They can go home the same day or the next day. Um, again, specialized dressings. A hyperbaric oxygen therapy is again approved for arterial disease and some venous disease depending on their insurance and offloading is important for all, pretty much all wounds. Uh, pressure ulcers, they, you know, these are not very common in the hospital but once you do have a pressure ulcer, the cost to repair that ulcer is it's significant. The amount of pressure ulcers that we have in this country is enough to fit, you know, in the entire New Mexico, the state of New Mexico. So over two million annually of pressure ulcers. That can occur at home, in the nursing home, in the hospital, like I said, even from the ambulance ride to the hospital starts the pressure ulcer. The key to pressure ulcers is not to get them in the first place. So anything we can do to educate our patients, um, and our nurses are very good at the hospital of shifting the patients, coming in every couple hours and asking them to shift positions. The treatment for pressure ulcer, number one is pressure relief, pressure relief, pressure relief. Um, nutritional care is very important. If their protein levels are not high enough, they won't produce the cells for wound healing. 
Uh, we monitor closely for infection and debridement. You may notice a wound uh, one week that just looks a little red. The, by the following week, it's gangrenous if the person stays on it and they're not moving. Um, and again, we use specialized dressings as well. Uh, uh, radiation. So delayed effects of radiation is, is not one of the more common wounds that we see, but it is something that some patients do see. What happens is, and this is more common for patients who had radiation therapy for cancer many years ago, and we can see patients who had cancer up to, I think we had a few that have been 10, 20, 20 years, years or more. What happens with radiation, especially um, in older radiation <laughs> styles where you got more of a dose, is radiation doesn't know what the cancer is. So they're killing the cancer, but that also damages some of the other tissues around the cancer, which really causes microvessel breakage and, and disease. You may not see that right away, and most patients don't see any issues until at least six months down the road. And that's where we see radiation patients, is when the microvascular vascular structures start to break down, and patients will notice in the area where they had radiation that the skin starts to break down and just is not healing anymore. That's where we use hyperbarics for these patients, is primarily the, the way that we take care of that. Right. And it is less than a 5% chance that patients get this who have radiation. So it is a very slim chance to have it, but we do see patients who have it, and it is very complicated without some of these treatments to treat. Right, and hyperbaric is one of the most effective treatment for radiation-induced wounds. You know, whether it's radiation that they receive for rectal cancer, radiation of the jaw for oral cancer, radiation of the breast. Again, it's not very common, but when it does occur, um, it is something that we successfully treat. Um, and like, like Dr. Miller said, GI patients as well, people who have bleeding after treatment for colon cancer and other diseases, um, this is really the only treatment that has been proven to actually regrow those microvessels for patients who've had this kind of complication. Correct. So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is something we've talked about a few times throughout this presentation. This is a picture of what our hyperbaric chambers look like. There are a few places throughout the state that have hyperbaric chambers. We actually have named our chambers. We had a little contest a couple of years ago, and the staff at Riverview named them Wiz and Oz because of the wonderful things they do. And I think our winner is actually here in the one, yeah. <laughs> the person who picked our names is here. Um, so they have names. but. Having these hyperbaric chambers right in town here is huge for our community. A community our size to have this therapy is really great. Patients who do need this therapy, who don't succeed in, in traditional wound healing or these radiation patients or other um, wounds that do need this, if we don't have it locally, they need to drive at least an hour every single day, five days a week for up to 60 10. treatments yeah. sometimes, up to 60 treatments. So that, that's a huge drain on patients who need to do that every single day. So we are lucky enough to be able to have this here in our community, right in town. And it is a big commitment for patients, but it does work. It's one of those things that when you actually look at something and see, it's like a miracle seeing some of these patients when they come out, that we've tried everything. The doctors have... Right, we've but, gotten blood flow to their legs, we've taken care of their venous disease, we've addressed their nutrition, their diabetes is well controlled, and it's still not healing, um, then, you know, we go to the hyperbaric. And how it works is a patient goes in this chamber with their clear acrylic tubes, I guess is the best way to explain them, and the patients receive 100% oxygen under pressure, which means higher than one pressure that you're at right now is one. So it would be higher than that. What that does in your body, it allows your body to have more oxygen in your blood. It actually allows your plasma to carry oxygen. And oxygen is one of the key things that you need in order for your body to naturally heal itself. It allows some of those microvascular structures to regrow and allows your body to naturally heal itself when it's having trouble doing so. Right, and also uh, oxygen, certain bacteria, they do not like oxygen. You know, they like nice, dark, warm places, and so they don't like oxygen that much. And that can also help 
with the infection. We have patients that may have what's called necrotizing infections where the infection is spreading rapidly by second. The, the hyperbaric will start off by killing off that before we can get them to surgery if we have to. The patients who we do who we do use HBO with, and now not all of our patients have HBO. Like Dr. Miller said, this is a last resort when everything else isn't working. Patients who have had poor blood flow, who have had interventions with surgery, some of them are candidates. Some of those with chronic bone infections, the necrotizing infections, some diabetics, some who've had surgery who if you've had a flap or some, a surgical procedure where that flap is starting to fail, and Dr. Miller can explain that, and then the radiation. Those are the patients we primarily see at our center. Right. So with the uh, failed flaps, we may have patients who have traumatic injuries or we did a skin graft. And for that skin graft to take, it needs you know, blood vessels, it needs microvascular structures to form. That's not going to be rapid. So most of the time, by seven days, your body's regenerating vessels so that that flap can take and also the, the skin graft can take. But within 24 hours, if it starts to look blue, that's a sign that it's failing. And we may bring the patient to the hyperbaric chamber right away to start getting oxygen into that tissue you know because just your regular blood vessels will not bring that oxygen to that tissue we want to infuse every cell plasma in your body with oxygen and we have saved patients leg from trauma with this and minimize how much of a, a flap or graft we may have to do so that's how the hyperbaric works for that so it's bringing oxygen to those little cells and giving that flap or graft a chance to take and work. Can you talk about the chronic bone infection? Yeah, chronic bone infection, again, any wound that's been present for four weeks or more is at risk of bone infection, especially in an area where there's pressure points. So we would x-ray to see if there's an infection in the bone, start the patient on antibiotics. Typically, they need six weeks of antibiotics preferably intravenous. Sometimes we've done oral, but then we might use two agents for that. Um, again, bone is not as vascular as you think of your marrow, but the cortex of the bone does not have, get en enough blood supply. So the antibiotics sometimes may not reach. Your normal oxygen that you've taken may not reach that bone. And this is, again, where hyperbaric might be great because it's infusing everything, your plasma, your bone, your marrow, everything to get that bone to heal. In addition, sometimes we may have to take the patient to the operating room first to clean out that bone, get that infection out. But some areas you just can't get to that bone uh, surgically. It's too high risk for that. So we would do the antibiotics with the hyperbaric. Okay. So any questions do you, that you have? about wounds, chronic wounds, anything we've talked about? Yes? No, you do not. Most, most insurance companies, I would say check with your insurance company just to make sure, but most insurance companies do not require a referral. We always recommend you talk to your primary care first before seeing us, but if you have something or you want to come yourself, you're always welcome to call and make an appointment. Yes. Can um, your treatment help somebody with ulcers due to lymphedema? We have lymphedema treatment, which usually involves compression. Not so much hyperbaric, but we do have compression therapy working with lymphedema, and we use our physical therapist as well as the Bathke building to help with massage therapy for that lymphedema. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming tonight, and we look forward to seeing you at future Aspiring Women events.